Tonight, I want to welcome everybody to tonight's forum. Um, it is about train your brain and the resources that we have at South Pasadena High School and throughout the district to help our stressed and anxious kids. I'm sure yours isn't stressed and anxious, but your friends might be. So hopefully this can help. And uh, we have the wonderful Natasha Prime here. Natasha Prime is our school social worker and train your brain specialist. She's a licensed clinical social worker and has been with the district for 15 years and has worked at every one of the five school sites with both general and special education students. Her passion for almost 30 years has been working with adolescents, young adults, and their families. Now I'm gonna pass it over to her and I will bring up her presentation. Thanks for being here. Hi everybody, it's good to be here um, to talk to you about the Train Your Brain program. I wanted to plug another SPHS Instagram account. Um, that is the SPHS Wellness Instagram. Uh, we freak, I, I, our team frequently works with them and they post a lot of great stuff that is actually applicable to um, the stress and anxiety we're gonna be talking about tonight. All right, next slide, please. We'll get, we'll jump right in. So train your brain is this, this phrase I think we've been hearing a lot about and it seems like a lot of people aren't familiar with what exactly it is. And um, it, but it's been around since 2015 when we were already certainly I, I was probably uh, the only mental health type person at the time. I was uh, working as the special education counselor. Uh, and then re we realized that special ed students, they get counseling as, as one of their services if it's needed to help support them in school, but that there wasn't really something like that for our general education students. And they were experiencing as much anxiety and stress and, and, and issues as other students. And so uh, in 2015, Dr. Lefebvre, who is our Director of Student Support Services and Special Education, he uh, wrote up and created this program called Train Your Brain, which was uh, hopefully going to help address and support students' emotional, social emotional needs on campus as well. And this was kind of back when there wasn't as much conversation about mental health in schools. Uh, we didn't, it's, it's pre-pandemic, pre pre-all of this conversation. And so it was pretty forward thinking, I think. So he wrote up this um, proposal and we presented it to, um, he wrote it up and he hoped that I would be willing to uh, deliver a portion of it. And I said, sure. And so he, uh, we proposed it to SPEF and, for, and we were able to get a major grant to see if it would be uh, a valid worthwhile program. And so every year the numbers grew and uh, so we would present to SPAF and say that, yes, this is working, please fund us another year. And so they did for three years, at which point we had to um, present it to the school district to see if they would be willing to take it on. And so in 2018, they did fund a full-time train your brain position for um, at the secondary school level. So I was three days at the middle school, no, three days at the high school and two days at the middle school. And then they hired someone else, um, Natasha Stebbins. Some of you might know her. She's the train your brain person at the middle school now. So she then took over the um, counseling for our special ed students. And then uh, it jumped to 2021 uh, post pandemic. And uh, fortunately, uh, silver lining, I guess, is a lot of money came down the pipe um, to support mental, the mental health of our students in schools. And so we were able to double uh, our train your brain services and have me full time at the high school and Natasha Stebbins at the middle school. Uh, next slide, please. So Train Your Brain is kind of this comprehensive program hoping to address um, our students' social, emotional development and support them when they're struggling uh, sort of from different angles. Um, the main tenets are what's called PBIS, Positive Behavioral Intervention Supports. And those are sort of things that are meant to address the entire 
student body. So uh, our teachers a, a few years ago now had training in PBIS and, and th those are, I, I like to say it's basically being nice, um, but being nice intentionally. Things like greeting your students at the door in the morning, may, may, helping students feel welcome and connected to their schools. It's recognizing when they do well, catching them being good, as opposed to saying, you know, as an example of that would be, oh, Johnny, you know, you didn't do your homework again. And, and, and the, the PBIS version of that would be, hey, Jimmy, I like how you came prepared today. Um, so those kinds of things. So the, the staff received training in that. Um, the other piece we looked at was the neuropsychology neuropsych of stress and anxiety. And so um, actually our program, uh, well, program specialist, yeah, she uh, works up in Dr. Lefebvre's office. She is a psychologist and uh, trained in neuropsychology. And so she did some training on helping people understand how sort of how the brain functions, especially in adolescence, and uh, with, with a particular emphasis on the amygdala, which is the part of the brain that gets hijacked when people are really stressed and anxious. So she did some trainings on that. Um, staff has been, uh, yeah, they've been trained in both those things. And then the third piece was um, in the world of cognitive psychology, and that was working with students and helping them explain, how, uh, understand how the way they think uh, affects the way they feel, which then affects the way that they behave. And so we've done lots of um, uh, small groups in class presentations, but primarily that happens in, uh, in individual counseling. Um, situations. Uh, lastly, one of the main techniques we've been teaching and using, and many teachers use it in their classroom as well, are mindfulness skills, uh, breathing techniques, uh, taking a few minutes at the beginning of class to settle in. And so that is uh, something we've been using a lot um, with our students just to help them learn how to self-regulate when they're dysregulated. Next slide, please. Another thing that is under the purview of Train Your Brain is um, AB 2246. So AB 2246 is an assembly bill that was signed into law in 2016 in response to an increasing number of youth suicides. Uh, some of you might remember many years, not that many years ago, but a long time ago, there was a series of uh, youth suicides at Gunn High School up in Palo Alto and uh, made a lot of news. It was a similar demographic school like ours, very highly achieving academic. And these, these kids were taking their own lives. They were, the school's near a train track. And so that's where it happened a lot. So out of that came a lot of things, one of which is challenge success, which I, Kristen is, uh, is on the challenge success team. Maybe some of you are as well. Um, but one of the things was this AB 2246. There was a realization that um, there needed to be suicide prevention policies uh, in, in all schools, of course, primarily for prevention, but also intervention when there was a suicidal student and um, sadly also a, a, a post-prevention policy if there wasn't a suicide on campus. So, um, in, uh, in, and this was supposed to begin the 2017 school year. So, um, SPOSD did create and adopt a suicide prevention policy. And um, the, it, it requires that there is suicide prevention presented to staff, students, and parents once a year. Uh, for grades seven through 12. So that is also something that uh, Train Your Brain does. We've done it in a lot of different ways. We've gone into classrooms, we've gone, we, uh, during COVID, we presented it virtually. Just recently, we sent out a um, link to a webinar on suicide prevention for parents in English and in Spanish. Hopefully a lot of people saw it. And uh, this year we are going to present to all of the eighth grade English classes 
to make sure we get all of the high school students. Um, and we're actually uh, joining with the peer mediators and the ASB health and wellness team uh, and uh, ESS, which is, I'll tell, talk a little more about that later. And uh, Ms. McHenry, who's our special education counselor. And we're gonna go in teams uh, because there are 57 English classes. So we're gonna try to figure out how to deliver that. Um, okay, next, uh, next slide, please. So here's our plan for this year. Um, as far as meeting students' needs, um, there's always individual counseling available to them. Uh, generally, uh, I, I, we'll talk about the referral process in a minute. So uh, also crisis support, and that is really everything from uh, the increasing number of students who experience panic attacks at school or they have uh, maybe a, uh, a breakup or a friendship issue and they can't focus and so they'll come in and so we'll respond to that. Of course, we also do um, suicide risk assessments and threat uh, assessments if there's an indication for that. A uh, new thing we're doing this year, which is great, we piloted it at the beginning of uh, last year, and that is restorative resets. Uh, this We used to have Saturday school, um, some of you probably recall, so students, for whatever reason, whether it was a disciplinary issue or attendance issues or things like that, would be assigned Saturday school. And um, the idea of kids going on Saturday for four hours in the morning uh, just didn't seem to be that effective when in fact we had a group of students captive and could maybe do some um, social emotional learning with them. So uh, David Speck actually went to uh, training on restorative practices. And so we're trying to implement a lot of those. So now instead of a Saturday school, students get assigned uh, to go to uh, late starts. They usually have to go to two late starts, which would equal one Saturday school. And on the first, the Tuesday of the late start, we've partnered with Chinatown Service Center and they come in and they have been uh, presenting workshops on Emotions 101. So the one tomorrow morning is on anger. And so that's been really great. They're young um, MFT students who come and do this and they're very eager. And I think the, the kids have really connected with them. And then the Wednesday late start is usually led by myself or Ms. McHenry or um, one of us to, it's, it's a less formal, more of a restorative circle type of thing where we might talk about what has been discussed the day before or just kind of talk about what's on people's minds and all with the goal of hopefully helping students feel more connected to school. Uh, what else? Uh, In-class presentations, I mentioned that uh, we are doing the AB 2246 presentations, but next semester uh, we have two interns, two uh, master's in social work interns from USC that we have for the whole year shared between the middle school and the high school, and they're going to work on a presentation for next semester after we get through all these English presentations. Not quite sure what the topic's gonna to be yet, thinking maybe uh, healthy relationships or something like that. So that's to be announced. Campus outreach, we try to be uh, available and visible. Uh, that's some of where we work with the ASB wellness students and the peer mediators. A lot of times we're a little bit behind the scenes and they, they will come and talk to us about topics they wanna to address and we will help um, behind the scenes, sometimes help uh, staff a table or something like that. Newly, we have uh, the therapy dog who's coming, who's also been going to the middle school. So uh, myself, usually if I can, I'll walk around with the dog just because that's fun and the kids love it. Uh, today, my intern uh, walked around with that. So all, all again with the idea of helping kids feel connected and relaxed and safe at school. Uh, work with the wellness students, yeah, that, the, that's the ASB wellness students and the peer mediators. Um, for teachers, 
Uh, we have been facilitating some workshops through Effective School Solutions, uh, which is a partnership that uh, through whom we hired the therapists, which I'll get to a little bit later. So they have all of these workshops available for teachers. And so we've made those available. Um, there's uh, PD webinars for them. Uh, we are working on the in-person ones. We're trying to get um, get the, that ironed house out. Uh, we also are always available for consultation uh, with teachers on student support. Uh, we do a lot of communicating with teachers and we are available to um, support students in SSTs or, or 504s as well. Um, parents, we talk to parents, um, love talking to parents. It's really always great when we can get the families involved, even though a lot of times teenagers don't necessarily want that. Um, and if they don't initially, we do try to work towards them agreeing to bring in parents. Uh, we also help provide resources. And uh, again, ESS um, has provided a lot of virtual parent workshops and you may have seen some of those. And then of course the occasional email blasts um, that you might get from someone related to Train Your Brain. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here's how it works to get support. Um, basically, the team is myself at the high school, uh, Natasha Stebbins at the middle school, and Ms. Fiona McHenry uh, at the high school who works with the special ed students, but also works a lot with us with the restorative resets, and uh, we've done some restorative circles with some friendship groups when issues have come up. And like I said, we have two interns, Monica and Lauren, they've been great. And then we have our ESS therapist, Eddie Babayan, who is great. The kids really love him. He's very kind and very gentle and he's, he's out there. He likes the sun and trees. So he's often outside and he's just engaging with the students and it's, it's been really cool. Um, the way to uh, get services is uh, you would talk to your counselor first, if possible, if you have some concerns about your student. And uh, if it's an issue that they can't address or maybe don't have the time, they would then refer that student to me. And I will um, kind of figure out what's going on and, and, and triage. I am unfortunately too busy to be able to see students on a very regular basis. My students tend to come on a drop-in basis. They know they can reach out, email me, leave a note on my whiteboard or whatever and say, hey, can we please talk? Um, but Eddie is available uh, for more regular weekly short-term uh, therapy. And, but he is a resource mainly for students who don't have access to outside therapy support. Um, or for some students whose parents maybe don't believe in mental health support and, or, and um, they, they request it. So in California, young people over the age of 12 are, um, have the right to consent for their own mental health services. Um, so they can come and get support um, that way through him. Um, he also works with families and the same sort of thing as, as what I do, but more sort of clinical ongoing type of therapy. Uh, so then I will also triage students if it's sort of a mild need or, or, or something that's not too complex, I might uh, assign them to one of my interns who are you know, young and enthusiastic and they're in their second year of their master's level social work training. So they're actually very good and they work under my supervision. So um, they are able to also do more regular uh, interventions on a regular basis with our students. Um, what oh, wellness workshops. Okay, so that's um, something that we try to push in as much as possible. And um, the parent workshops for ESS, the PD day, professional development days um, for staff, we um, 
um, again, outreach, kind of like we talked about before. The other thing that we have um, is we have a, a, the room, the space, the classroom, former classroom, where Eddie, the therapist, is located and where my interns also sit. And it's we're trying to create it, make it to be sort of a wellness center type place. Uh, that's where we do the restorative uh, resets and where we have small groups sometime or sometimes where we do our restorative circles. We also have a smaller wellness center, which is uh, in located in the counseling center. And that's a space where students can come. There's a little iPad sign in sheet. And um, if they need to talk to someone or it's a crisis situation, they'll come and they can sort of hang out there, wait to talk to someone. Sometimes they just, they don't necessarily wanna talk, but they just wanna sit and take five or 10 minutes to, to regroup for whatever reason, maybe something happened at brunch, maybe they did poorly on a, a test or something happened and they're not quite ready or can't be in class. So we'll sort of talk to them there. We have, that's a nice little space. There's coloring and fidgets and, uh, things like that. It's right outside of my office. So if I see a student in there, um, I'll always sort of zip by and check in and see if they want to talk. Or sometimes it's just about doing a little breathing with them and giving them the five minutes and they're good to go back to class. Um, the middle school has a very fancy wellness center. Um, as some of you may know, that's going to have a grand opening pretty soon. Um, so that'll be, that'll be really nice. I uh, I think that's it from this slide. So next slide, please. All right. So, okay. Well, I already kind of went over that. This is how you refer your student. Generally, you would go through your school counselor. Um, uh, students can also refer themselves. And uh, we'll see the Train Your Brain website in a little while where it actually has a self-referral form for students, um, which comes to me. And then I would call them in and sometimes they prefer to go that way. Uh, also, uh, parents can reach out. I, again, I would suggest you reach out to your counselor first, um, but obviously uh, you can also reach out to me either by email or calling and we can talk about whether um, additional support at school would be beneficial to your student. Um, I think I covered everything on here, yes. Okay, so these are some of the things that we work with every day, obviously at the top of the list, anxiety, stress, overwhelm. I think this is something that everybody's been feeling to some degree, um, but our students are very, very anxious. Um, and that's from the highest performing ones to the lowest performing ones. Uh, they just, have so much to do, trying to do so many things at once, trying to maintain a social life. So it's caused a lot of anxiety and stress. And I think a lot of our young people just don't have the tools to manage these feelings. Because um, as we know, anxiety and stress to some degree is useful and it, it helps us get things done. But when it starts to get in the way of getting those things done, then you have to learn to regulate it. So a lot of what we do or what I do is just teaching them to recognize a, a feeling uh, and that it's not the end of the world. You can work through this and just to uh, teach them some tools to um, work through these feelings. A lot of um, low motivation. Um, I have, this year, I've seen the lowest motivation of any year that I've worked with students. Um, I think it's they're still in recovery from the two years at home and everyone's a little, about two years behind in a lot of things. And even though it seems like they should be over it and we should be moving on and getting back to normal. I think that's been really difficult for a lot of kids because a lot of kids, you know, they, they might've been a seventh grader. And then after the pandemic, they were a freshman in high school. And so the social development, the, the academic uh, development, the, uh, all of it, they're just kind of behind developmentally. And yet they're put in a position where they are supposed to be at, at the age that, they, that they're at. So um, a lot of times it just becomes 
overwhelming and they just I'm like, why am I doing this? I can't get myself to do it. So just trying to work with students, uh, finding a reason, a purpose to, to do all these things and helping them sort of break it down into manageable pieces so that it doesn't feel so overwhelming. Uh, a lot of issues uh, uh, with gender questioning and sexual identity. And that's just a lot of being there to just help them talk through things. I, I think uh, there's a lot of pressure on kids right now to feel like they need to have a label or an identity. Uh, and this is an area that they many of our students can can find their place but you know it also involves a lot of emotions and things that surround that so we're there as a support for them as well a um, lot of kids that are sad and down and uh and depressed uh we have a lot of kids uh who seem depressed and if they have the symptoms of depression for about two weeks or more then that can be considered a depressive episode and so then we kind of work with them on things they can do to try and work through that or feel better, you suggest getting outside support and um, things like that. Um, relationship issues always in high school, friendships, friendship breakups, friendship changes, romantic relationships on, off. Uh, so that uh, is of course uh, always a crisis um at that time of life um substance abuse and use is something we're seeing a lot of i think it goes hand in hand with the feelings of depression with trying to manage anxiety uh using substances is a coping skill unfortunately it's not a good one it's not a healthy one and often then becomes its own problem um, so I, I think as a school, we're really trying to address the issue. I am sure you've all heard, um, and it's not just at our school. This has become an issue um, nationwide. Um, a lot of it related to our sort of ambivalent and conflicting relationship with marijuana, which is legal, but you know, so, but that's a whole other, that's a whole other seminar. Uh, Self-harming behavior is another one of the negative coping skills that uh, a lot of our students um, engage in. So we work with that as well, um, provide resources and supports and try to teach them alternative, better coping skills. Um, Eating disorders. This is another thing I've seen a lot of this year, uh, which again is all, it's a self harming behavior, um, and it's often when students or kids feel like they don't have control of their lives. That is one area they can control, which then can become a disorder in and of itself, and um, of course suicidal ideation, which you know comes from untreated depression generally when they feel like they can't think of any other solutions. And so that is something that I often ask. I will ask the question and it's surprising how many students have had the thought and then we just sort of talk through that and um, try to come up with alternatives. Next slide. Okay, here is our fantastic website, which actually I'm very proud of because my interns last year were the ones who created it with our guidance, and I would highly recommend that you check it out. It's um, It'll give you a little blurb on the staff and the referral process, uh, which, as I mentioned before, that's where kids can self-refer. And, um, and we have a fabulous page of resources. There's all these different kinds of, all, all issues you could possibly think about and there's resources um, addressing all of those. And we also have kind of a fun link tree on that, which uh, has many different helpful uh, resources and fun little meditation things and calming games and stuff like that. So I would highly recommend you check that out. And um, next one, boom, here we are, Q&A. Awesome. There we go. 
stop that. And thank you, Kristen, for doing the slideshow for me because I am frequently technologically <laughs> challenged and that caused me stress. <laughs> Happy to do it. I, my computer is acting really weird though at the same time and I couldn't see my cursor. So that's why I messed up a little bit. Um, so um, if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat. I only see one so far, um, which is what is the wellness Instagram name again? I, I think it's SPHS wellness. It's got like a little pink. I'm going to actually look it up right now so I can make sure I give you the right one. But I think it's SPHS wellness. Mm. SPHS wellness. Yes. Yes, it's, that's what it is. And it's got a little pink circle with a cat, I guess a tiger in it. Wow, very cute. Um, and then just going back, so you said you're going into 57 English classes for the suicide. Is that, that's at the high school, but you said you were going to the eighth graders and you're going to the high, all the high school kids? No, 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 that's, did I say eighth graders? No, it's it just the, the English classes. I don't know if I said eighth grade, that's not what I meant. <laughs> Yeah, no, we're going to all 57 English classes. So it's, it's quite an undertaking. And also, you know, it's, it's going to take time away from the um, instructional minutes. So we're going to have to lobby a little bit to be able to get in there and uh, do our presentation. So we're going to start doing those in November and keep going till they're done. Awesome. That's fantastic. Um, Another question, what percentage of students are asking and getting help from your team? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I am not very good with percentages, but I can tell you that so far there's been contact um, at least once and with many several. Uh, we're at well over 100 students, uh, which maybe doesn't seem like a lot, but it feels like a lot because these interactions generally take a lot of time. Um, I, I, I can get you more specific numbers and percentages. I did not come prepared with that, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. That's a great estimate though. Um, I just love the stories that you tell me about the kids that come in and how you help them. And I love just the story about the, the dog that came in and really helped one of the kids the first day the dog came in this year. So it's nice to see that the dog's there too. So even, you know, my son who hasn't come in to see you, if he saw that dog, that would make his day. So <laughs> oh, yeah. the dog has been great. I mean, he could totally replace me. Um, I mean, when we, when we go out there and walk around with that dog, that, that's all you need. And even, and we try, like we walk around and we try to go, maybe there's some kids who are sitting alone or who might look sad and we'll, we'll approach and see if they want to pet the dog. And um, it's it's amazing. Even the even the two cool for school kids come and pet the dog. Awesome. Um, there's a question wondering if you could speak a little to how students who present as high achieving are quite good at hiding eating disorders and substance abuse with some of the kids who on paper might seem to be doing quite well. How can we look out for these sorts of unhealthy expressions of stress? Well, I think, you know, the, the thing with eating disorders, which is so complicated, is that you can't always tell by looking at a person that they have one. There's, there's clearly some students who look very thin and very emaciated, and, you know, you can, you would want to ask or, or check in with that student and, and see how it's going, but um, that is, it, it's really related to anxiety, the eating disorder, because there's, there's all this anxiety about the eating or the not eating. And then, you know, being fatigued or uh, sort of low level because you're not getting enough nutrition. And so then you're in class and you're not really able to um, take in instruction. And so then you fall behind, which then causes its own circle of anxiety and stress. I think, um, I know it's, it's, it's hard. It can be hard to monitor your teenager's food intake. And I'll tell you, most of them probably don't eat breakfast. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily think that that's a clue, but um, a lot of kids don't eat lunch for whatever reason, and then they don't necessarily eat dinner. So I think as a parent, you just kind of want to notice uh, how your child is around food. 
if, if you're eating with them, are they moving stuff around? Are they just picking at it? Are they eating two bites? Are they going to the bathroom right after they eat? Just kind of notice your child's eating pattern. Um, and, or, or, you know, is there an obsession maybe with weight? Um, are they covering up their bodies um, to sort of maybe hide what their bodies look like, bodies are looking like, whether it, they feel it's, it's, it's too big or whether they're hiding how small they've become. Um, so I think those are really the things to look for as a parent. Sometimes their friends notice and know. Um, and I've actually had a, a couple students come in about friends that they were concerned about. And it's a very uh, hard thing, first of all, to admit. And sometimes there's just sort of disordered eating, which isn't necessarily an eating disorder, but then it can progress into that. So I would say if you're noticing changes or you're noticing anything about your child's eating that has changed or is, is weird, a lot of times a precursor to an eating disorder is to become vegetarian. Uh, not that that's always the case, but that can, it can sort of start that way and then progressing to the vegan with this notion that the less you have to eat, the less you will eat. Um, so if your child does have an eating disorder that needs to be medically treated by a medical doctor and generally along with a nutritionist, because your child has to then relearn their relationship with food. And it's, it's very complicated because you can't not have food. It's not like any other uh, disorder or addiction or issue like that because we need food to live. And can you address the substance abuse part of that too? Because that the yeah. eating disorder part's great, but is, are there any other signs we should look for with substance abuse? Well, yes. <laughs> um, I think, you know, we're often hesitant to maybe like go through our kids stuff, especially teenagers. But I think if you have any sort of inkling or you notice anything, I think it's okay to go through your kids stuff you, and, and look for things like vapes and uh, nicotine vapes and weed vapes. Um, actually, I just heard a, a new thing. A, a student came in the other day and was uh, talking about another student who was peer pressuring them to do Nick. And I was like, do Nick? What does that mean? And it's do nicotine. And so this one student didn't want to do it and was asking for ways to, to ask this other student to stop peer pressuring them. So like doing Nick is now kind of like doing weed. Um, things to notice, change, change in your um, students' friends. Um, because it, a lot of times this is what we see in high school is friendship groups change as some kids start to experiment with weed or smoking. And maybe there's a student who doesn't want that. And then the, the, the person who's experimenting immediately there's a, gets a friend group, right? Because the um, using kids are the most welcoming group. Um, on campus because they have that in common, right? Like it's a connection that they can have with each other. So if you have a student who doesn't want that, then a lot of times they have friendship changes and it's hard to then find other kids who maybe aren't using. And same with kids who are using. If you have, if your um, child all of a sudden has a, a change in friends, that's something to pay attention to. It could just be a you know, social rift, but a lot of times that is the thing that tends to separate kids when they're in high school. Um, the reason why um, so many kids are using, I think is because it's become so readily available and they think it's safe. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, literally they can get it through Instagram or Snapchat, just, you know, there, there was a case last year where, you know, kids would, order it on Instagram. And then the one student uh, was able to get, take the orders and then deliver them. So this is all out of the purview of any adults, right? Because we don't, we're not on those accounts. We don't know what's going on. And most kids have their regular Instagram account or whatever that they share with parents. And then they have their other accounts, which is where the real action is. So 
Um, again, I think it's noticing any changes in your student, maybe uh, things like being a lot sleepier, um, uh, maybe missing school, um, but also we have a lot of our high functioning kids who are um, smoking as well. And I think for those kids, it's more about relaxing uh, because they're so stressed. And for you know the maybe less performing kids, it's more about um, kind of escaping what, maybe feelings of failure if they're not that academic, maybe issues at home. Um, it's again, it's a coping skill for students, and because we have more students with more issues and more severe issues, um, it that's an easy one, right? That's an easy one to go to. So again, it's knowing your child, noticing changes in in their friends, maybe their clothing, even maybe their um, dressing, yeah, differently. Um, just paying attention, noticing. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here about um, someone says that she, you guys have helped her daughter with her anxiety and she's worried about it getting pro progressively worse in college since it's starting early in high school when there's not that much responsibility um, and it's less stress. Um, and she's kind of wondering, you know, do you think it will get worse? Is it one of those things where she should probably not go away to college and should stay close to home? What do you recommend for kids that are already anxious so young? I, you know, uh, the more I've been doing this, the more I think about uh, prevention and uh, restorative measures and uh, finding our kids' strengths. Um, because I think a lot of times kids will feel like, oh, I, I have anxiety and that, that defines them. When in fact, that doesn't define them. It's just something that they have. And, and people who have anxiety often live with anxiety. And so it's more about learning to manage that, learning to recognize when you're starting to feel anxious and then having your toolbox uh, to deal with it when it happens. And so it, I, I wouldn't <clears throat> I wouldn't necessarily, I, I mean, I, it depends on the situation obviously, but I wouldn't necessarily say uh, to a student, don't go away to college because of your anxiety, because then that's putting them in a position of like, oh my God, I'm gonna have such anxiety at college. I, I'm not gonna be able to function. I think it's more about recognizing, okay, so you have anxiety. It's, it's good that we know that now. Let's work on getting you the tools you need so that when you do go to college and you, you come across situations which will cause anxiety, that's that's realistic, that's also part of life, that you will know what to do. You will know what your triggers are, you will know what your tools are. And also campuses have, you know, mental health support as well. And uh, I always tell all my students, when you get to your college or, or, you know, make sure you connect with their wellness center or their mental health support team. Great, thank you. Um, somebody asked if the parents will be able to see the same content that you're giving the students in those English classes um, so we can continue the conversations at home. Will there be any, like anything sent home so we can A, know it happened for those of us who have children who don't tell us anything? <laughs> ah, which is probably a lot of them, right? Yeah, I think um, so. <laughs> Sure, I think we could make that happen. Um, there, there, there's a, we're trying to do like a 10 minute presentation, which is already ready made by the wonderful Erica's Lighthouse. Um, shout out to them. That's an organization that has been doing suicide prevention in schools for years, and they have amazing curriculum that is pretty much ready made. Like any teacher in a classroom could do it if they wanted to. They have a standard based curriculum that can be delivered in health classes. So we're going to do a reduced version of their presentation and then have um, a conversation afterwards. So maybe you know, maybe we can record one and um, I can get it to you for, for viewing. That would be awesome. Um, I also want to just let everybody know that if you missed it last week, last week it was like I don't know, it's within the last two weeks, time is going crazy for me right now, but there was a wonderful um, suicide prevention 101 given um, 
that, that was sent out by the district. And we actually have it on our PTSA website. So you can go back to Facebook and watch it. It was really well done. It was, it was a great 101 for parents and what to look for and what to do and who to contact. Um, so I'll put that back in the chat. Um, but if you also record the thing you're doing in the class, I can put that on our website as well. And we can send that out through Mr. Aldred and our newsletter and everything. So that'd be awesome. Um, question about um, when do you contact parents when kids are meeting with you or other counselors and struggling in some way? Okay, so um, generally, if there is a safety concern, parents will always be brought in. So if um, we're doing a suicide risk assessment and the student is at risk, we will immediately, of course, bring in the parents. Um, and you know, have them come and take the student to um, for a psychiatric evaluation. Um, and uh, if parents aren't available and we can't get anyone on the emergency contact, sort of the worst case scenario is we contact the psychiatric mobile response team, and that's through the LA County Department of Mental Health, and they would then come in and do the assessment. Uh, we we always hope to get parents to come because sometimes we have to wait six to eight hours for the team to come and then they have to find a bed, which is very hard to find. Um, so I've been known to stay till 11 p.m. waiting for a team to come. So if there's a safety concern, um, suicide risk, or uh, perhaps they are a threat risk of harming someone else, um, we would also, of course, bring in parents. And um, other safety concern is if the child is at risk, someone's hurting the child, um, then that would generally involve uh, parents as well. Now, um, some of these behaviors, which are very concerning as a parent, and I'm a mom too, they're grown, but um, like self-harm. What if we have a student who is self-harming? So I think as a parent, you would automatically assume that you should be contacted if that was the case. However, self-harming behavior isn't um, necessarily suicidal. Generally, it's not. That's more, uh, that could be an accidental situation. And a lot of the times it takes a while to get the student to come around and share that with their parents because they may be filled with shame. They may be, uh, maybe they have parents who wouldn't necessarily understand or be sympathetic. So while that is sort of a broader safety concern, it's not necessarily an immediate safety concern. So we wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily, because I obviously I have to make sure the child is, um, gonna feel safe, right? And sometimes it just takes a little while to, to get the child to understand, you know what, your, your mom or your dad, they would want to know that this is happening. You know, they would want, they would not be mad or upset with you. And if you need, I can help you talk to your um, parents about that. They're not doing anything, why am I doing it? Hello. <laughs> um, so, basically must contact parents when there is a, 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 a direct and immediate safety concern. Um, but my goal is always going to be to bring in the parents. It just sometimes takes a little while. Yeah, sounds good. Um, do we offer any type of wellness services for the teachers and staff that you know? Um, <laughs> informally sometimes I do but um, we have the um, the district has the ease program which is the employee assistance something something it's it's ease and it's offered through the district and if um, teachers are struggling uh, with with anything that they can get um, some support through the ease program Fantastic. Um, how often does the therapy dog come in right now? Every Monday at lunch. It's the highlight of the week. Nice. That's super fun. 
for me and the staff too. The staff are like, make sure you come by my classroom with the dog. <laughs> and if any of you have middle schoolers, the therapy dogs go into the middle school too. I don't know what day, but I know the dogs there Friday. too. Friday. Friday. Friday is a Nice. Um, so if people if people need to get a hold of you or a counselor and they've emailed and not gotten a response within a, like how long should they wait for a response before they email again or there's uh, I think the rule is 48 hours to respond. Um, uh, I really uh, try to respond uh, quicker than that. Yeah. Um, so the way to reach me is nprime at spsd.net. And, uh, or you can call me and uh, my extension's 2985, but you can always have them put you through. Um, the, the counselors are very, very busy. So I think their turnaround time um, might be a little slower and it's not because they're not paying attention. It's because they really are very busy. Yeah. Um, is there a place that if we have heard from our student that, there, that somebody might be having an issue that we can report that? to you or the school? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, see something, say something that applies to everything. And a lot of times students come to our attention through other students who are concerned for them or from parents who are concerned. So yes, absolutely. You can go to your counselor, you can go to me, you can go to the administration um, anytime there's a concern. Okay, awesome. It, it, it takes a village as they say. It does take a village. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, I think that's all we have. Okay. End a little well, early and let everybody get some rest. <laughs> okay. So yeah, and if anyone has any further questions on any of this stuff, I'm I'm always happy to to talk about um, your particular uh, child. I really appreciate you doing this, Natasha. Thank you so so much. It's hugely helpful and. Um, we'll send out some of the links that we sent out today. We'll put them in our newsletter next time too, just so people have them as well. So they have, have your website and have all that information when we send the recording out. Okay, great. Well, take care everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye.